Hello and welcome to a new episode of Other Record Labels. I'm your host, Scott Orr. Thank you so much for tuning in, where we talk about the art and culture of running an indie record label. Speaking of record labels, if you are new to the show or new to starting a record label or you're currently running a record label, make sure you head to our website, Other Record Labels, to check out some of the resources we have there, including our free guide, which kind of summarizes some of the uh, wisdom that uh, has been shared with us in our interviews over the past couple years. So go to otherrecordlabels.com to check out that and other resources we have for existing labels and for new record labels. Speaking of record labels, today is a very exciting episode. Imagine your group of friends you're hanging out and one is a filmmaker filming everything you guys do and another one uh, is uh, another guy in your friend group is uh, the guy who's always playing acoustic guitar. Now, imagine fast forward 10, 15, 20 years later, and these now iconic individuals, the filmmaker Emmett Malloy and the acoustic guitar player Jack Johnson, who have gone on to do some incredible things. And while you're listening to this episode, go ahead and Google them and Wikipedia them and see the projects that they've been involved in over the years. And no doubt, Uh, something that you have probably enjoyed in that mix. Uh, Such such an honor to talk with Emmett today, one of the co-founders of Brushfire Records. And, you know, Jack Johnson is an iconic artist and has really played an incredible role in the uh, evolution of indie music and and how we view it and, and how it crossed over into the mainstream. So such an incredible episode today. I hope you really enjoy it. Thank you so much for doing this. By the way, yeah, this course. is such a pleasure to, to chat with you, and I have such a yeah, history. yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't do these often. Meaning, I, you know, I I feel like I can count on a one hand how many brush fire <laughs> oh, comprehensive <good. laughs> conversations I've had. So, it, well, it I'm will honored. Be interesting. I'm honored. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm I'm psyched to do it. It's a that's a good part of this era. Is a uh, it's reflective, you know? Sure. No, that's true. I have this photographic memory, but only for moments when I'm buying records. Like <laughs> for some yeah, reason, yeah. I can grab a record off the shelf and remember where I got it. I have this memory. Oh, that's cool. I have this memory of seeing the first Jack Johnson record here in Canada at an HMV on an end cap. And I think it was uh-huh. one of, I think it was even one of those CD players where you could put on headphones and sample it. And right. I, yeah, I remember, yeah, I love those. Yeah, I bought it right there. And I, I was wondering like, was that record released on Brushfire, or did that label come afterwards? Like what? Nah, ca- yeah, came came after. So I'll give you a quick yeah, little please, history please. of it all. You know, Jack Jack and I were young guys, and and um, all connected through the surf world. So through making surf films, my cousins are the Malloy brothers. We direct uh, me and my brother Brendan direct as the Malloy brothers. So it's hmm. this funny, hmm. um, overwhelming family where people always feel like a Malloy. A Malloy brother is watching over them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, my cousins were on the North Shore surfing, becoming pro surfers, you know, California kids making a name for themselves. And they connected with Jack there just because he's a staple. His family is of the North Shore history. And they, um, I at this point was making films, um, working on like as an editor, working on like movie trailers. I cut like the Star Wars episode one. Oh, wow. trailer and uh was working on like movies for studios but i was getting to know all the the ins and outs of the business and i started to direct a few music videos um uh for bands like san diego kind of punk bands that mm-hmm. were uh ended up being like blink 182 and um unwritten law and some yeah. cool bands from the past yeah Anyways, my cousins were like, oh, Emmett, could we do a film with all your gear? Because I was always saying, hey, we could do it. And I felt like I was at a point where I could confidently say yes to that. And they said, all right, we want to shoot some 16 millimeter. And in comes their friend Jack Johnson, who was at film school in Santa Barbara. Hmm. Anyways, we all started making films and becoming best of friends. And all of us were finding our voice or what we were good at. And, you know, through hanging out with Jack for a long time, he all of a sudden just started playing songs when we were hanging out, whether it be <laughs> traveling or making films. And, you know, he would go from like a pavement cover to one of his own. Uh, and 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 you wouldn't know the difference because they were both like good songs, sure. you know, like 
I didn't know anybody, you know, I never had a friend who was like good at writing a song or anything yeah. at that level where like all of a sudden your friends like uh, Elliot Smith or something and you didn't know it. <laughs> and so he, he started making these four tracks and, and through our surf network, those started kind of finding their ways, finding it themselves into the hands of Kelly Slater and Rob Machado and guys that had, you know, at that point, point their own way of influencing people with their taste, hmm. whether it be writing about it in a magazine. And, and all of a sudden his music started to gain this, uh, like, uh, m underground, like Bo Jackson <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> quality about it in, in the world. Cause it was good and undeniable when you heard it. So can, can I ask anyways, you what, sorry, can I ask you what year this yeah. is? Yeah, this is like probably 90, 97. Oh, 90, okay. You wow. know, kind of getting into 98. Okay. Um, and so anyways, just, the the quick version is that that started to circulate and at the same time we were making these films of which jack's music started to become a bit of the soundtrack of but mm. we were also super influenced by the ben harpers and the g loves of the world who had put out their first yes. records yeah. that were staples in our diet of creativity and traveling and whatnot so i remember we had ben harper's manager this guy jp plunier who ended up producing Jack's first record hmm. came in to look at this edit. Cause we wanted to use a Ben Harper song and, you know, in walks this like French, you know, very like, uh, you know, but he's a trendsetter himself. Sure. So yeah. he rolled in and we were like, Holy shit, Ben <laughs> Harper's manager. You, we had never met a yeah. manager or anything <laughs> at that point. And so he came in, he watched our films and a relationship started to grow out of that where he then, he knew all about our surf films. He knew Jack's background and family. He was that type of guy hmm. who historically knew a lot about surfing and skating and music. So we, we all got on real good and, and, you know, cut to like, all of a sudden that Jack's music and these tapes start finding their way to record executives and, um, I remember specifically Lenny Warnaker and Mo Austin um, really interested in it at DreamWorks at mm. that time. And, you know, we started to catch like a fun, uh, like, you know, the, the mini disc were landing everywhere. And then <laughs> I was in LA and I would make a bunch of cassette tapes and go pass them around. And wow. so suddenly JP was just like, we, we thought we were going to sign a deal somewhere, but n nobody, everybody just would say like, They'd bring Jack in. He'd play these unbelievable songs, whether it be Flake or Posters, mm. uh, Fortunate Fool. Those were in the first wow. repertoire. And we'd sit in these offices and you'd watch people's jaws drop. And then nobody, I think everybody thought we were too young or something. You know, mm. certainly there were artists that young being signed, but we we didn't have any official we rolled in and here's this guy saying like, I may never want to tour ever. Oh, right. This is just like, I want to make surf movies. You know, <laughs> he was kind of given the, like, it felt like Goodwill hunting. Like I was like, you would walk out of there and he would have said everything that would probably reflecting back. Wouldn't have made you want to sign yeah. him. You would. <laughs> At that point, people were really giving people a lot of money to say, we want you for a long time. Sure. And so anyways, at the end of it all, JP was just like, why don't we just do a record and we'll start a label and we'll put it out. So hmm. we, we began as partners with them and they created a level at that time, a label at that time. It was called um, Everlove. No, it was called Enjoy Records. Okay. And then it's now become Everloving and they put out a lot of great records over the past decade. But they put out our first record, and we also did it with Modular in Australia. So our friend mm -hmm. Steve Pav was really on Jack early and got him on a great label there. And we went out as that. And then Jack hit the road with Ben Harper, and, and that was just connecting so great. You'd oh, go sure. to the show, and it just was a magical connection. And so that record came out real independently, but then the song – got on radio at 91X in San Diego. Flake really started to take way, and then all of a sudden Jack's on the road, and our small label, the record wasn't where it needed to be just because it was the reality of, yeah, of, of, of what we were prepared for. And at that point, a lot of big labels started to come in, 
we had then put out a few surf movies on our on our own on our own that that felt like we had uh, you know we had just we had matured a bit you know mm-hmm. like that's it we kind of started to realize like hey we could do a lot of this ourselves i i was very confident as a guy who was you know um i was good at seeing things through you know sure. with jack like i've always been a good guy at working with artists because i feel like maybe i'm half artist half business guy oh that's great I'm, yeah that's know, so kind of stuck in the middle neither here <laughs> neither here nor there but you realize you're kind of like oh wow shit i'm one of the guys who can kind of uh cater to both sides which you find now through this much time in it you feel like you see a little more of your good at one or the other yeah and so you know my relationship with jack was always real solid because um I kind of, you know, him being from Hawaii, like he never wanted a part of this business, you know, it wasn't like he ever aspired to be famous or it just kind of happened. And it was Mm. this very natural thing. And suddenly this, your friend is kind of your makeshift manager because he would get calls from like people and they'd say, Hey, I mean, I remember it specifically, Hey, do you have a man bring your manager? And he was like, uh, he was like, okay. And he hung up and he's like, I told him I'd bring my manager. And I was like, okay, well, here we go. And then, you know, cut to now his wife and I have continued to manage him all these years. And Amazing. that's a lot of why it feels the way that it does. And, you know, as much as that's a positive for us, it, it can also be real limiting at times because our, our palate, it's almost like you have to be related to us to be part of our gig which is why it feels family oriented but it's hard to bring people into your family sure. you yeah, know because they got to check a lot of boxes that's a good point and um so that's always been part but from there we we when the record kind of took off at radio flake did um we became you know the folks from republic records monty and avery lipman who unbelievably are still running that label Mm. this many years later uh just kept showing up and they they convinced us like look dude we don't want to act like we can guide you creatively we just think you guys you know this record's got it and we want to support it and let you guys do your thing was that a rare was that a rare state of mind for a label to be in the late 90s yeah yeah Yes, for sure. Because like when we did that deal, I mean, I'll put it, I'll give you some context. I remember it when Jack won a Brit award after, um, better after in between dreams, he, he won basically like the best in, you know, foreign artist in at the Grammys mm-hmm. at the Brits. So it was a big deal. And he yeah. was like out there playing better together, sandwich between Kanye and a hundred <laughs> Uh, gold dancers and you know <laughs> in walks me and Jack with a stool a guitar just kind of something you'd see out of a funny charming yeah. movie yeah. <laughs> and he goes out and smashes it much like Elliot Smith did you know same sort of charm sure. but I remember Prince really f- hawked him down that night because Prince then at that moment was signed to Republic and Jack's deal was a big you know, one of those deals that a guy like Prince would have loved, huh. like you maintain everything you, wow. you get, it's just a, it's a, basically it's a business collaboration, but the creative is all you guys and the money stayed mostly in our thing. Cause we were like, we've done this, you know, we want your support. We want to get it on radio. We want to play on that level, but we kind of just want to be our rootsy label, like our family run business at the core and, you know, we were able to even get a better deal than we had struck with ever loving and enjoy at the time, because that deal was more of like, we're 50, 50, we're just happy to get a deal, you right, know? Right. And from that point forward, we realized even from there, we can improve greatly because we were just saying no to everything until people got kind of outrageous and then you're like, okay, well, maybe this is a yes now. <laughs> and and that's continued on with Jack and a lot of his things. I mean, certainly a lot of people have struck that deal now. It was a churning point type of deal. and um, But it gave us a label to be kind of hide behind those same credences, you know? Sure. And again, from there, it's not like I have another Jack on our label where you can 
sit there and really demand the kind of deals that you deserve and you know he can always worldwide probably cover it sure it was more complex after that but you know even coming out of the gates with guys like matt costa we were able to give them great deals and sell real records and and you know whatever i look at it with josh nicotra that runs the label with me I mean, we're still around, which, yeah. oh, you know, absolutely. I've watched every other label come and go. And a lot of it's that we've had like little, like almost like when Michael Jordan retired for a year, you know, we take <laughs> kind of years off. And then okay. like now I feel like we're in this zone where I'm like, I feel a lot of creativity coming out of our camp and with the guy, with new people like Afi that are basically brothers now. Wow. There you feel like another really cool chapter ahead for Brush Fire, which two years ago I would have been like, ah, maybe I'm just going to get deeper into filmmaking right now because I'm very, you know, I was a filmmaker before I was his fake manager. Yeah. And so it, <laughs> you know, I'm also, you know, I get on little spurts where that's something I really want to have a lot, you know, more focused energy on. So it's, it's a juggling act, but. We still we still can do it, and I actually feel this is going to be a real big year for us because Jack's revving up, Afi's got a record done, wow, and we're going to start doing fun like collaborative projects just because we're kind of I think this this pandemic has kind of put us in this fun space of like Jack just like starting to work on track tracks remotely with people. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's a and good that, point. that works good for him. Yeah. You know, he can sit at home in his board shorts and, <laughs> and do it, you know? What was it like? I mean, I, I was completely back then, I was completely enthralled with all these, these post Dave Matthews singer songwriters that were coming onto the scene. What were things like ba- back then? And do you think there was a, um, a certain spotlight on the singer songwriter that helped yeah, you guys? It's, it's, it it certainly felt it, you know, I, I don't know because that feels like it's continued, but there was a batch there. I mean, specifically, obviously, yeah, I know Jack played a show with Dave Matthews in college. They opened for him mm. once. So he he had some like ringside looks at that. Okay. But I feel like he was probably always viewing himself as being more like I'll probably be in a punk band or, you know, that was kind of okay. where I think his heart was. But I don't know. I definitely know like Since the beginning, it's, you know, we've been like dueling in a fun way with the the success and career path of John Mayer and you watch them become still the the big guys, you know, the big artists of that time, both so successful in their own way. John Impervious can almost join in on anything and pull it off. Yeah. It's insane. I mean, he has transcended so much. And Jack is probably, you know, they probably, you know, I know John's commented on Jack just admiring how he's never changed. Good point. You know? Yeah. And so I think at the beginning, it was like they were like, you know, you could not be competitive. We weren't actively competitive. But I mean, those two records came out almost at the same time. Mm. Like literally, I feel like they came out within a very short window because we were tracking that. I remember when that video, his first video came out, I was like, what? They shot a little bit on film. Like I was, (laughs) that's our trick. Things that you would, nobody knew, but they were all, they were affecting us. Cause we were like, I mean, the last time, we had been in a competition was probably like in a sports game. Yeah. You know, like we weren't, (laughs) it was like this new world where we were like, competing you know in a funny way like it was like a fun uh you know challenge or something yeah and so there was him and then we saw like guys like howie day blow up that's right then maybe you know that career i don't know where it went same with like a jason mraz who like that popped up and we were all like what that guy's just trying to be G love, you know, <laughs> at the beginning. and, and those things where you, again, you look back now and you say, Hey, we had a cool influence. You, right. you yeah. now can be on the other side and say, those are all fun things to look back on. But yeah, it was, it was a big genre then. And I feel like it was something we really paid attention to because we were, in it it was like us mm-hmm. trying to find our way in it and trying to be you know always be like what would ben harper do 
Yeah. What would Ben Harper do? Yeah. And then oh, all of a sudden, sure. Jack blows past Ben Harper. Like, and yeah. I felt like a month. Wow. Yeah. And, and then you're on the other side of that going like, okay, is this now like a co-headlining tour? Or <laughs> w- right, what is it? Right. But again, all those things just turned into great friendships and um, lifelong relationships. But at the time it was a lot for us. We were young and, and, you know, just trying to figure it out. Um, you know, it was, it was new terrain. It was the, <laughs> wild west for us it's funny how um for younger people for younger fans of jack johnson you'd have to tell them who ben harper is and for younger fans of john yeah. mayer you'd have to tell them who dave matthews is i uh, agree <laughs> yeah it's really interesting I remember, that way you know i remember um when we're as we're still talking about other singer songwriters i remember donovan frankenwriter around the same time and he was yeah. such a great artist and and love that guy i picked up his first record and i, I remember was having a consistent vibe for the label something you were conscious about was it people are coming here because of jack and his aesthetic so let's do more of that yeah i think it was a little bit kind of what we knew you know Mm -hmm. i'd like to say that it was but you know it was like the same guy taking photos the same dude (laughs) doing the layout (laughs) jack produced and wrote a lot of that record at jack's studio right you know so those things but it has been a like I told you earlier, a little bit of a push and pull that philosophy, because like on that record, I think it really set up the record, but then cut to like a year later, I think Donovan was feeling like, I don't want to just be Jack Johnson. Yeah. Uh, oh, sure. You know, I don't want to be another surfer or songwriter. I'm Donovan Frankenwriter. And again, Donovan's somebody we've all known since we were little, huh. like Jack filmed Donovan in surf movies when he was young. And Donovan was the, mega star and jack was the you know blue collar filmer and so you know we there's a lot of a a backstory in some of these relationships but you know the donovan one is a clear thing of that one succeeded because it felt like jack in a lot of ways and i think that ultimately became a reason why he was excited to do his next record somewhere else because he felt like he, you know, maybe wanted to set a different path. Oh, sure. Know? Yeah. So let's go back to that era because I was actually just reading this morning about the, the dawning of the iPod and, and back in 2001, that would have yeah. happened over this time. Oh, what was that like? Can hey, you take no, me back there? Straight up, straight up. iTunes, Jack's on and on record was like their, their top, launch for oh, iTunes. Oh my god. Like gosh. I remember being in like having the, you know, equivalent of an NDA back then, which is just like, hey, be cool about this. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, on wow. the phone. Uh that 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 whole and that's why that relationship with him and Apple, I think, has continued to be a very successful and well fit one for us as they've supported him like a founding you know, father Mm. of that platform, but that on it tunes, you know, not specifically, it wasn't like a collaboration or anything. It was just straight timing. And it was an artist that, that in, you know, Jack ended up doing a keynote with Steve jobs right before he, you know, um, died. And, and Steve was a massive and very knowledgeable, um, guy about Jack's music and his business decisions, you know, That's incredible. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah, I did not. Well, I mean, I I can think back to that 2002, 2003 era, and that's really cool that he, I mean, you guys probably had no idea what iTunes was going to become launching yeah, that. Yeah, no, for sure. That's incredible. Let's go into the filmmaking side. Can you tell me about that connection? And and, and I'm, I remember, I mean, I, we're talking about like me being in this this community as a fan. And I remember when Thicker Than Water came out, it seemed natural for something like that to come from the the Jack Johnson camp. But now you're telling me that was where the origins are. So how has filmmaking stayed a part of the label or, or even been the core of the label? Well, I think it's, it's, it, it, it just is because that's kind of our infancy and that's where we kind of grew out of, you know, I mean, that's where mine and Jack's relationship came. That's where Jack's, I think, artistic eye and, and a lot of, the songs that he wrote were those trips, obviously a lot of personal stuff too, but those trips are really all over the first two records for sure. Sure. Um, 
And so I think it's just kind of whatever. That's that's who we were. I think if you look at Jack, I mean, truthfully, I think it's kind of more Jack's a surfer before all else. You right, know, I mean, right. that's, that's what he is. And so the filmmaking was this like celebration of the the background and the influences that that he was and is. And then the the music started to become this undeniable talent that was growing out of the doldrums of making films hmm. you know like for instance he got into guitar when he hurt got in an accident when he was young and and then he was able to you know have all this downtime not surfing playing music but yeah i just think the filmmaking also do it was kind of who i was and wanted to be as well so like as you're sitting there going like oh my god my friend is blowing up we're starting a label where we're you know the workload in his camp for the last two decades has been immense on me and it wasn't ever something that i was like that's what i'm going to do but i always wanted to be a filmmaker so it just i made sure the filmmaking was part of what i was doing with jack and brush fire and making jack's videos and you know those things just all continued and then it was you know he was busy making music, but I still wanted to see surf films being made because I felt that they were so integral into our story mm. and to our background and to who we were. And so we continued on. And my cousin Chris made a few more movies under the Moonshine Conspiracy. That's another interesting thing. If you look at our at On and On, the first you know couple of copies. That record like came out and did really well out of the gates, and we were called the Moonshine Conspiracy. That was who we made um, surf films under that, okay. you know, kind of moniker. So we were just going to be a label called the Moonshine Conspiracy, and we put it out, and a, a label called Moonshine Records threatened to sue us. And we were so young, we we didn't think like, oh, we should just go back to him and explain. We don't have much to do with one another. Uh. But we just were like, ah, fuck it. We'll just change our name. <laughs> and I always regret that. But I do love that we landed on Brushfire Films and we then spun Moonshine Films to uh, Woodshed Films. And so we were Brushfire Records and Woodshed Films. Right. But lately, we're bringing back all the moonshine conspiracy stuff because I finally reached out to that guy on Instagram, and he's like, "Yeah, it's cool. I don't care." <laughs> and he was real open minded, and I, oh, cool. you know, some of me was like, "God damn it! Why didn't I do that two decades ago?" <laughs> but the other part was like, you know what? It's kind of a time because right now, like for instance, I'm doing a a biggie documentary for Netflix that I'm near done with. It's the first license film that the family has ever hmm. put out, you know, that I could use everything. And I'm witnessing like the nineties are really, people are very nostalgic for oh, the nineties sure. right now. Absolutely. And so I'm like, well, that's our era. So I'm just more real excited for what we can do moving ahead. Mm. When we I want to talk about music videos for a second, because I know yeah. that, you know, looking up uh, on your Wikipedia, that's something you ha played a big role in, um, is, especially for a certain era. In your mind, what has traditionally been the goal of music videos back then, and what role do they play today? Huh, it's hard for me to get super into the today answer. Okay, you know, because yeah. I still feel like you know, I still get asked by bands i like whether it be a war on drugs or mm. somebody and i'll go out and shoot what kind of feels a video like i would have used to have shot yeah you know yeah now i guess the way people things can connect you know if i was working with a young band i think i would have to just sit listen and learn kind of like i do when i do ads for brands you okay. know you just have to really get into the philosophy of what everybody's trying to connect with but back then it felt like you had a song good enough to get money to go make a film, you know, and you just wanted to like, you know, again, much like uh, you were talking about the singer and songwriters, mm -hmm. like back then there was only like a handful of directors that did music videos that oh, played really? on the big level. And so it was competitive that way where it was like, I want to take down, you know, I want to be as good as Spike Jones, you know, that's <laughs> the stuff that you, did it was a little more that it was you know blink 182 kind of really competing with some 41 and channeling some of that energy and for jack it was always like you hate you don't want to put yourself out there that way the the idea of doing a music video to a 
lip synced track yeah never right. sat right with him oh so sure. for us it was always like what's a creative or physical challenge that i can give you that will make you excited to go make this film clip because you appreciate this tradition but he could never get into the idea of of, of just like making a standard video so that's been a hilarious process through the years of trying to figure it out and lately he's kind of just taken it to his own mind and done like kind of more roots ones that he does at home stop motion or mm. uh you know kind of things like that and that's been fun to see i think the authenticity of those type of videos resonate more nowadays um, oh yeah for a for lot sure. of fans um no doubt it, when, when you were doing things, um, YouTube and streaming video were evolving so quickly. What was it like being a filmmaker? What is it like being a filmmaker at that time, at this time? Is it stressful to keep up with how quickly the tech is changing? Yeah, I mean, I feel like filmmaking in general is kind of like a stressful um, <laughs> gig. It's so competitive, sure. and it's just always like you're only as good as your last thing, and you put out something, and by the time it comes out, you wish – it was different or everything has changed, but I don't know. I still think it's kind of the same thing. Something's good or not. It, it hits. The thing I've liked about our projects and films is they seem to hold good through the years. Sure. And I like that we're not, you know, I think my, um, the thing I pay attention to most is kind of connecting with the feel of what we do, things to be authentic and emotional and real feeling. And those seem to be more timeless elements. So I think I'm a little still trapped in a little more of an older school mentality in that world. But doing ads and campaigns for companies, you have to flirt in the modern era and participate there. So I, I do have to keep sharp in those worlds as, as well with the label. You have to be sharp like a guy like Afi right now you know, he's as much of an entertainer as he is a musician. Oh my gosh. And, and I want to take advantage of that going, oh man, now I got an artist that really can blend both disciplines well. And <laughs> yeah. we're feeling real confident about what's ahead for us, taking advantage of what the modern world has to offer. Sure. He is probably the funniest comedian I've ever seen live. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I would. Don't you agree? I mean, he I would buy Netflix special. He totally does. <laughs> I, I feel like going to a concert is like a stand-up with a little bit of music. Yeah, I oh, agree. I agree. What a treasure! Uh, let's talk about. I want to ask you just a little bit about the still on the same vein of this visual side of things because you started out as a filmmaking um, with surfing and then the music as a as a soundtrack and then of course Jack blows up. Um, the marriage of visual uh, visuals and music is that important? Do you think that should be important for artists and for labels? Yeah, I mean, I always like when an artist has a real point of view. I mean, the one thing I'll say as a label we've never been is like this is our this is our sound and blend in it. It's it's always hard having an artist label cuz I think people overthink it. Okay. You know, yeah, like they they true. do try to like either react against it or or blend in too much with it and sometimes not get it right. Yeah. And so, but that's, uh, that's other than that, it's kind of like been this very free spirited relationship, which again, I relate to them all. Like you do what you do. I'm, I'm not, I want you to feel prolific and, and channel the energy of your ideas and your vision for your record. So I think the visuals, you know, again, you can kind of all apply them, you know, with Jack, it's always been very collaborative. I think he's known I can pull off anything. So we've always been ambitious with our ideas and, and wanted the visual thing to like have something fun or bring in a big celebrity that he just thinks it'll be classic to work with because they'll do all the goofy stuff and he can <laughs> kind of play it straight. Yeah, right. And where like a Matt Costa at the beginning, um, you know, he was so young that he had all his influences. So I feel like he was excited to go with the flow a little bit. He, he was a very tasteful kid and, and knew like again was influenced by all the right people of the past and embodied them in his presentation. So there was a lot to work with, but there was also at the core, a young kid just excited to be like, wow, that's a film camera, hmm. you know, things like that, that you're like, come along for the ride, you know? And and then you saw his confidence grow in each video we 
got to a place where he got a little more ambitious with it. Then somebody like Afi is so loaded with artists and friends in his network that certainly I've done quite a few things with him, but he's best when he does his own thing right. and it feels really spirited by him. I'm there to help and whatever, but yeah, we do, you know, we still value the whole process. You know, I want the album covers to look great. I, I still think a little bit like it's the physical package, even though it's, it's a distant second to what people are reacting yeah. to. But I will say, I do think after seeing this Kakua festival go and see how great Jack was on that level, knowing AFI's kind of good, I feel the new version of brush fire is going to be a cool, a uh, blend of of music and entertainment. That's that's what my prediction is. Really? You know, not necessarily tons of new artists, but just kind of having more fun with with some of the uh, content. Well, it's so great whenever talented people don't take themselves seriously. Yeah, I think that's what I mean. That's what I love about Afi and 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 yeah. I, I mean, let me ask you just real quick about Bahamas. I mean, um, this mm -hmm. is uh, Afi is probably one of our greatest natural resources here in Canada. But let's yeah, so uh, awesome. Can you tell Amazing. me about his journey to the label and how that all yeah, came yeah, to be? Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, it's a great one. Uh, so we have um, mutual friends, um, like so. Uh, Leslie Feist is was friends with a girl named Janella that used to work at Brushfire. Okay, and um, so through that relationship, his um, Pink Strat landed in my lap. Okay, and at that point, it was a finished record and had been out, but real limited release. Um, nothing in the states. Okay. I really dug it. I met his manager, Robbie Lackritz, who we've gained a great relationship. And he actually produced Jack's last record, which is a, another great sign of how our relationships mm. all take on. You know, you just end up jiving with talented people, you know, like, wow, Robbie's very smart, has great ideas, produces great records. So anyways, we met, he came to our office and I remember I was like, I think I was about to have, no, I wasn't in kid phase yet. Okay. <laughs> but anyways, I, I, we had a great chat and I was like, and he was from San Diego, even though he lived in Toronto. So we knew a lot of people through the surf world and a few things where we connected. And I just said, look, we're, we're into it, you know, we'll, we'll do it. And Jack kind of, you know, was getting around to his music, but I was like, this is the guy, trust me, like, <laughs> let's do this. And, and so then he came to town and I remember like he was doing a show and I was like, let's go surfing. And I took him out surfing him and Robbie with my office. And, and I took him out on maybe a little bit of a suspect day, you know, it wasn't <laughs> like maybe the easiest. Yeah. And, and, and anyways, he ended up cutting his foot bad. And there's me on the deck of my friend's house, like looking after him, like a, <laughs> you know, a boy scout. And here I am. And again, it just had that feeling of like we're all like look at this we've known each other for five minutes this is kind of a business day and look at our thing and he chatted about it that night at his show in LA and whatever from there the the relationship grew and we, and we've you know we've stuck behind that guy and and done very well with him mm. and I think his, the best is yet to come I still think he's relatively under appreciated Agreed. I think maybe you know, like if you look at his Spotify numbers and his, you know, some of the data, you'd be like, he should be a lot bigger than he currently is. Right. And, you know, that thing's just a matter of time. He's had flirt, he's flirted with hits mm. and, uh, and his music, it, you know, you just know he's the real deal. And, and that's somebody I hope we can do records with for a long time. And he's kind of the second win of brush fire. I think without him, I'd be looking at it like, ah, let's just fold it down to kind of Jack. Yeah. And oh, Jack. sure. But instead we had kind of our most exciting artist, you know, guy who's kind of now shown the greatest career outside of Jack on our label. Mm. He's with us for a couple more records, which that gives me a timetable to be like, cool. Let's just say for the next, at least five years, let's get busy and do some cool stuff. And that's why I've liked brush fires. I've never made it so big that I put myself into any funny spot. Mm. I've always spent the means that I had. Josh 
and I and Kizzy that that help run the label and Jack's day to day. We just are real low budge and simple and and kind of all get after it. And so I've never got the flash office or the <laughs> crazy thing that made me feel like, oh, I gotta get this. I've always been able to say, hey, if it fits and it's good, we'll do it. And and that's continued to be a nice philosophy because it's spared us from feeling like we got to go bankrupt or something, you know? Well, that's exciting to hear because, I mean, you really do have the right to, you know, shut things down or slow things down. And and you were talking about the reminiscing. I mean, you could just do reissues for the rest of your life. And and yeah, like we want to do a covers record right now where everybody covers another band and that sounds really exciting to me. And like, there's, we haven't done any of those things. Like I got, you know, like Lee scratch Perry right now wanting to remix some Jack songs. And I'm like, you know what guys, we haven't done any of those things. Let's do them all for a while. Yeah. And then let's make new stuff because that's of course what your, this stuff will inspire you to do. Yeah, that's and incredible. Jack's every time Jack's done a collab, it's been great. I mean, even if you go back to the handsome boy modeling school version of his song Breakdown, people still are like, I wish you'd do a whole record like that. And <laughs> the cool thing is one day we probably will. Yeah. But we haven't yeah. yet. And he's made all his records with the same band, the same setting. And, you know, in one way I'm like, ah, oh, we gotta mix it up. In another way, I'm like, Cool, we haven't because now we can do almost anything and it won't feel like we're chasing or um we're doing something we already did before are you you kind of touched on this earlier are you guys feeling motivated and, and prolific in during this pandemic to be prolific during yeah. the pandemic that's awesome yeah well that foot festival was a great example i mean that raised over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, of which we thought would would just be you know maybe we thought we'd raise 50 wow and and it was really entertaining and it showcased like well sorry if the wind's bad that's okay if 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 the um you know like with our background of course we're going to make an entertaining show and make the transition smooth yeah and jack loves to collaborate with people so of course the collaborations are going to be good and so it just started to make us all go like, hey, let's do more of this. Let's try. And again, who knows? And I pray the world snaps back somewhat closer to normal soon. Yeah. But, you know, for now, we'll go. And I can tell Jack had fun doing it. And I know Afy's already locked and loaded with the record. And we're more now. Like, I just got him to uh, on there doing, like, Quibi's redoing The Princess Bride right now. Okay. I think is... Uh, and so that is something where he's kind of been asked to score one of the Rikuder, uh, track. No, it's Mark Knopfler, Mark Knopfler okay. tracks. And so, you know, those are just fun things that are happening out of this weird moment. Yeah. And yeah. I, I hope that continues to grow and we'll be front and center for it. But I definitely feel like we're going to have a, a fun, productive, uh, run right now. But we will when we snap back, too, because, um, you sure. know, our two kind of heavyweights are ready to go. And, and that's, that's awesome. when we, as a label, have more. And that's when you start going, ah, if we're up and running, let's do this, that, and the other, too, because we're in full source. Because, like, I went and did a film on Biggie and another film that took me, you know, that year was a little focused on that. Sure. And thank yeah. God sometimes my juggling act doesn't work out as well as <laughs> other times, but I feel like I'm finishing things. And then the good thing is I can then move into, um, you know, really being focused on brush fire, new offices, new things that just feel like whatever you need to like stare at the mirror every day and convince yourself you can, uh, do some cool stuff. So I feel like a nice, fresh chapter ahead for us do you have a what was the year that brush fire officially started do you know like how many years have you been at this yeah it's like right around 2001 okay so you're approaching a a 20th yeah we are for sure and so many different albums and almost you know 25th closer to that for brush fire fairy tales well i guess it's more of a 20th but yeah we're 
we're hitting some great milestones and we're kind of still the same group of people. That's incredible. You know, Josh. Beautiful. Still works with me and Kizzy now has been there for north of a decade. Wow. And that's kind of it. And then Jack and his family and then we flex up for touring and um, figure out, you know, each album cycle we put together according to the size and scale of the record. That is is so incredible, and it's so encouraging to hear your state of mind twenty years into it, especially when you have the right to to sit back and cash in on on the artist. So it's so so cool to to hear that. And thank you so much for doing this. It's been such a yeah, so much fun course. to chat with you. You know, I, I've been. Yeah. A, I've been a fan of of Jax now for 20 years and uh, such an incredible yeah, career too. and a uh, Bahamas obviously I I probably uh, shouldn't admit though that the the record that gets the most plays around here is the Curious George soundtrack that's pretty iconic yeah. You know it's it's one that I think even Jack grapples with you know I think that the album outshined the movie yeah, you know right. I think we kind of view that and that's wish true. that there was more to that film when you see the great animated films like the latest Spider-Man or, you know, we wished maybe they would have, but that, you know, that's a big reason why young college kids and whatever love Jack now because right. they grew up with that record and yeah. then realize that, whoa, he's got a ton of records and they're all good. I always say to Jack, that's one of my favorite records of yours. Oh, same. period. Same. Without yeah, any disclaimer, sure. I'll even take the sharing song. For and sure. And <laughs> it just, you know, it kind of came at a point when his career where, you know, we were at that point, you know, you're after In Between Dreams, there was a real critical buzz. And Curious George, I think some days got a negative rap feeling like he's just some corny kids artist. Right. And it was, you know, those are just like any review thing. You'll read one excellent one and one that feels really maybe mean spirited and focusing on something. But I know that record is a staple for every family. And it's not often now that we both have kids. How valuable is a record you can all like? Oh, man. You know, like, absolutely. And, and it's, it's timeless, that, that too. Is, yeah, and it has a great message, and it's educational and entertaining and beautiful. Oh, yeah, I agree. I, you know, and that's a record that I think is a is a. Now you look back, it's like it's a big part of who Jack, how he evolved to where he is now, mm. and he is he's one of the popular guys that's that's really stayed the same. You know, I mean, he's like my most normal normal friend. I mean, try <laughs> try, yeah, you know, like I got guys that have nothing going on that are so much. I have so much more baggage <laughs> than Jack. And here's a guy who's, you know, become so popular around the world. I've seen every tremendous high you could ever imagine with this guy. 35,000 people out mm. in front of him at times for his own show um, all over the world, singing songs and languages they don't even know every word. Mm. And he's the best dad, the most normal dude. And it's just kind of just become more and more elite in my category of like, dude, I get around a lot of your type, famous people. You are a very unique, you're a gem and we'll Amazing. appreciate you more and more as the years go by. That's beautiful. Thanks so much for doing this, Emma. I, yeah. I'm truly honored to talk to you. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you too. Thanks. It was fun. Like I said, I don't do it much. He almost got me emotional. Thank you all for listening. Please go to our website, otherrecordlabels.com, to grab some of our resources, including our free guide for indie record labels, as well as a checklist for folks who are in the process or thinking about starting a new record label. Check out Brushfire Records and all of the great artists, including our sweet Canadian Bahamas. Um, and, uh, and thank you so much for listening. <laughs>